Hello everyone. I hope you all can hear me from the back also. Great. Welcome to this session. Today we are going to talk about improving customer satisfaction uh, aut uh, with automated monitoring and anomaly detection. Before um, we start the presentation, I would like to ask a couple of questions uh, to all of you. So how many of you use an anomaly detection solution at your company today? If you can raise your hand. Okay, there are a couple of people who use it. Great. How many of you use it for driving successful business outcome? If you can raise your hands. Well, there are a few, that's great. And I hope all of you are familiar with Apache Pino. Any of you are here who are not familiar with Apache Pino? <laughs> okay, thanks for answering all my questions. With that, I will uh, like to introduce myself. I'm Madhumita Mantri, I'm a product lead at Startry. I'm with Startry for a little over a year. I worked with the founder and the founding engineers at LinkedIn and then uh, they came out and then they are building this uh, software for everyone and building it for scale. So I'm super excited to be part of this journey and I'm very passionate about anomaly detection in general and unlocking those data potential for data users to drive successful business outcome or making you more productive. So that's about me. I would like to invite Leon who's with me today uh, to talk about just Eat Takeaway use case. Hi there, I'm Leon. Uh, I'm a data engineer at Just Eat Takeaway.com. I flew in all the way from the Netherlands to do a live demo for you guys, so please bear with me. Uh, but uh, I give it back to you, Madhu. Thank you, Leon. Thanks for the nice introduction. So I'd like to start with a quote. Customer satisfaction. It doesn't happen over a period of time, over a night. It does need consistent effort to drive that memorable experience. And I would like you to take this key takeaway from this uh, session and keep that in mind. And that's something very close to me. So our agenda would look like, uh, some, somewhat look like this. We will start with introduction, uh, more about why customer satisfaction is important and what are the roadblocks that one could face, in, especially in food delivery app, because that's the theme today. We are going to talk about that. And then uh, what is an anomaly detection and why it is important for driving customer satisfaction and uh, what it takes to uh, find those anomalies and how to automate them. And we will talk about a little bit about uh, Stratry Third Eye, which is built on top of Apache Pino, how it is solving some of these pain points. And then uh, Leon will give a nice walkthrough of their case study, which has uh, happened at Just Eat and how they're using it in real time and getting the value and you'll also see a live demo. So a little bit of logistics, if you have questions, hold your questions towards the end um, and we will be here after the session also if you want to come and talk to us, interact with us or share your ideas, most welcome to do that. We have also Third Eye Engineering team here if you want to talk to them and we have a booth over here also you can stop by later. So quick introduction uh, about customer satisfaction and why it is important. Uh, well, there is an underlying intent, especially if you are the builder of the product, you care about your customers, your users who would like to use your app day in out. They don't churn from your product and they like your or love your product. And that's why customer satisfaction is important. Now, what it applies to food delivery apps. Well, I'll tell uh, one of my own story. And during pandemic, I got really used to food delivery apps. Before that, I used to cook, but then I got bored. And then I started using this food delivery apps. And whenever I'm hungry or uh, anxious, um, and I like to eat food, nice food. So I look up in the menu, what is the nice food, nice restaurant out there and I would like to order food. And uh, when I do the search, uh, what I look at is sometimes if the wait time is too long, I don't have patience or uh, the favorite menu item that I'm looking, if there's, uh, that's not available, then I immediately switch to another food delivery app. So you can see how my behavior is changing in real time and switching to another app is so quick. 
and you don't want to do that. Uh, you do want to retain your customers and how you can identify, identify those behavioral change in real time and getting those insights to take actionable, um, to take the next best action, such as if uh, there's increased wait time, that means there's drivers not available. And if you're alerted immediately, you can arrange the drivers and reduce the wait time. And likewise, there are many other examples you can think of. Think of. So now, what are the roadblocks that usually comes to, um, uh, food to enable customer satisfaction for food delivery apps? So I've listed a couple of them, which are very important technical issues that can happen anytime and that can cause uh, disruption uh, in food delivery apps experience and ultimately it impacts customer satisfaction. The other one is very important product experience, how your users are using your product. Like if I'm uh, used to using the product in a certain way and there's a new feature that got introduced or the button shifted uh, to somewhere else and I'm not able to figure out and that could also result in uh, going away or churning from the app and result in uh, impacting your overall customer satisfaction. The other one is demand versus supply. As I was talking about, there could be several things happening uh, in real time, traffic issues or weather conditions, or the restaurants are closing, you don't have the information in. Uh, there could be several things happening. And, and there, there's always demand, like you just are coming to your app and they are ordering food. And uh, if you're not managing the supply, uh, that, that will also be a huge problem. And finding that in real time is a uh, very uh, problematic challenge and it's very hard to find those insights and immediately act on it. The last but not the least, least is connectivity with your third party apps. That is also important, like for example, you're interacting with your drivers through a different uh, third party app and that needs to be also uh, up and available all the time. So now that we talked about different challenges, what is the normally uh, event? And I wanted to stress upon this. Usually when we talk about anomaly event, we think it's a spike or a drop or some change that is happening. But what we are talking over here is this unobvious change with a large set of data, which is not obvious to human eyes. And it, it could be a spike or a drop uh, for various reasons, or it could be a gradual change in customer behavior, the example that I was giving earlier. And uh, that can also contribute to anomalous events. And identifying those changes in real time is critical to drive engagement of your app and overall um, your customer satisfaction. Now that we looked at what is anomaly detection, now um, why anomalous events are important for customer satisfaction. So one is spotting that real issue in real time so you can reduce the impact to your business. The second one is also very, very important, spotting those positive opportunities that can also drive business growth. And this is an example that has really happened with Just Eat, and Leon will talk about it in, in how they enabled it in uh, some time. The example is they were running a campaign and that uh, resulted in driving more new customers. They were supposed to run the campaign for a sort of period, but learning this pattern in real time, they decided to run it a little longer and that helped them to drive more customers. And overall, of course, engage customers and improve the customer satisfaction overall for their app. Now, uh, let's talk about what it takes to identify those anomalous events. The first thing when uh, you run into a similar problem, there's somebody who is really worried about or who is monitoring this, and that's most of the time business operations in this example, especially when you're driving customer satisfaction. And your business operation team looking at some of the key metrics, whenever there's a spike or a drop, then what happens is uh, people try to uh, analyze where the problem is coming from, what is the problem, and why the problem is happening. So why to automate anomaly detection? What be happens behind the scene? Well, we are all in generative AI world and you all are aware that there's only a handful of people who are building those tools, enabling that tooling, but there's a large group of people who are talking about it, who, who are interested in or who care about it. Similarly, in this space, there's a handful of people 
data engineers or data owners or data platform engineers who are enabling this experience for the rest of the company. They know the answer of where the problem is, but there's a whole lot of your stakeholders who are worried and anxious and constantly chasing you what is happening and how can they get an answer to the problem that is at the hand, like the anomalous events and how they can take actions. So now what to do? Like obvious answer is automate the anomaly detection. How should we go about automating that? So well, first step is monitor those KPIs, critical KPIs, identify those, what are those? Identify anomalies as soon as they occur and find impact. That is very important. What is the impact to the end user and how you can enable those actionable insights so your end users can take the necessary action in the right time. So Startry Third Eye was uh, built on that um, being the guiding principle. It was born at LinkedIn. Uh, I have Suvidhi here in front of me who is founding engineer of Startry Third Eye. If you want to talk uh, about Third Eye, you can stop by uh, after the session and you can chat with him. Uh, well, the Third Eye uh, was built on Apache Pino with a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, things baked into it, like the architecture, very flexible architecture, and it allows you to do massive aggregated queries on top of large, on top of large scale of data in real time, and you can get sub-seconds of uh, query uh, latency results. And uh, one other thing of Third Eye is uh, most of the time I get this question, can I do a metric on the fly? Do I have to create a metric and store? Well, the answer is no to that. You could, uh, uh, sorry, the answer is yes to that. You can uh, create derived metrics on top of uh, the uh, Pinot data. You don't have to create a metric and store it in your data. As an example, like if you just want to do count star, you don't want to create a column count star and then store it in your data. Uh, you can do that using Third Eye very well. And if you have custom metrics also, that also Third Eye uh, gives a lot of flexibility to do that uh, through advanced uh, uh, JSON and then uh, templates that Third Eye enables for end users. The second part of this uh, Third Eye is the applied uh, anomaly detection part or applied science part where uh, you don't need to uh, write an algorithm, anomaly detection algorithm, run on top of your data, try to uh, pi uh, like integrate your pipelines and run, uh, identify those anomalies. So it is point and click experience. You can apply those algorithm out of the box. We provide a lot of uh, data science uh, models and advanced data science model or statistic models and also basic statistical model like percentage or uh, threshold or mean variance likewise. And the other thing we really uh, try to take care with while applying the uh, uh, anomaly detection algorithm, which is very, very important. A lot of the anomaly detection software doesn't allow you to do. That is how to get the accurate result. Because for every business, the business context is different. The things that you are applying, it could be completely different. And how you can apply those contexts to get the accurate result is what matters a lot. The third thing is once you identify those anomalies, now it seems accurate to you. Now you're interested, what is the actionable insight I can uh, see and how quickly I can get to it. And that also is being enabled and everything happens in near real time. And that's the uh, uh, best part because it is built on top of Pino. And if you're interested to learn more about Third Eye, you can always visit our uh, website. Without further ado, I will advance because Leon will be giving a demo and he will be covering a lot of it. I just wanted to call out that Startree Third Eye is uh, going to help uh, or our vision is to augment data teams to do more with less. So if you're a data scientist or data engineers, you can focus more on the business innovation, applying your business context rather than worrying about spinning up an anomaly detection software, running it or running your algorithm on top of it. You could also, it is very flexible. You could also um, attach your uh, custom models to it and not worry about the operations and be more productive than before. So that's why we uh, call that we definitely enable uh, developer productivity. This is an example 
not that every company would be following that same uh, process to create an anomaly detection software and run at the company. But the highlighted boxes is where we come in and make your life a lot more easier and uh, make developer productivity more important. So with that, I will transition and uh, hand it over to Leon, who will walk through the Just Eat takeaway uh, case study and then uh, give us a demo. So yeah, uh, this is one slide. I, I don't want to talk in depth, but uh, most of our users have given this feedback where uh, they had the pain before enabling third eye and the gain, and we will hear from Leon. Thank you so much, uh, Madhu. Yeah, before I'll start sharing my approach uh, on how we improved customer satisfaction with uh, automated uh, anomaly detection, uh, I'll do that with some slides, so some more theory, then I'll go through an actual demo. Uh, but before we go into that, maybe I need to introduce JustEatTakeaway.com uh, for you all. Uh, we are a global online food delivery company. Uh, we do over a billion orders a year. We have almost 100 million active customers. And um, you might not be familiar with the name JustEatTakeaway.com, but we have a lot of local brands all over the world. So in the States, we have Grubhub. Uh, we are particularly strong in Northern Europe, uh, but we're also active in Australia and New Zealand. So, so that's about JustEatTakeaway.com. Um, and we want to keep these 100 million active customers happy, right? So how do we try to do that? Uh, and basically, uh, we already heard from Madhu some of these things. We have two main drivers of uh, happy customers. The first one is you have a good online experience. Uh, you could find your right meal at the right restaurant and you ordered and the transaction was seamless. Uh, and secondly, you are hungry, so you want to have your food fast. So logistics needs to be very well uh, arranged. So let's elaborate on, on these two main drivers and see what metrics we can find to monitor them and to find anomalies and to improve customer satisfaction. Uh, to start with online experience, and this is basically I think in every e-commerce or every web shop has this scenario where you have a clear uh, conversion funnel and customers go from the home page to the list of restaurants, uh, they select their perfect restaurant, they come to the menu and hopefully they will check out and we have a transaction. And we monitor all these events and we have some metrics to monitor them. So we have a forward rate, so how many people go from one stage to the other one. Uh, we have, of course, the conversion rate, how many sessions do we have compared to the number of transactions, uh, but also just a total number of transactions. And what is here critical, because you might think, okay, we are monitoring all of our systems internally, uh, we have some telemetry, and when a system goes down, we will know. But we learned that looking through your to your platform from a customer lens. So actually looking at the web and app tracking events coming from your app and web tracking platform, that really enables you to look at, at your platform from a customer view and whether everything is working as expected. So some good examples are, uh, well, the, the bigger ones, right? We, we sometimes encounter DDoS attacks, so some services might go down, uh, but we also have particular payment service providers uh, not working well. So then you would see a clear drop in the forward rate from checkout to transaction. Uh, but yeah, you can also think of, of global site failures like uh, uh, CDN or DNS failures, or they only might impact some services. So yeah, we really, really monitor uh, our website experience from a customer lens by looking at this web and app events. Uh, and that's how we, uh, how we monitor online experience on a real-time basis. Uh, and I'll share more about it later. Um, and then looking at logistics, of course, uh, yeah, a customer looks at the, the available restaurants, so um, uh, in, in, in his or her neighborhood, uh, it hopefully places an order, the restaurant prepares the meal, and then finally uh, the, order, the, the order is delivered, the food is delivered, and there are two key things a customer cares about. Uh, we believe, so firstly, what we monitor is the, the, the availability, so the percentage of closing of a restaurant. There can be a lot of reasons why restaurants are not available. Maybe they're too busy, they shut down their, their site for a while, or they, uh, there's severe weather, so they cannot deliver, or um, they're, uh, yeah, uh, like these examples. Um, and secondly, of course, how long does it take for a customer to get his food? So that's also a crucial uh, metric uh, we are monitor to driving uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, and we have examples of, of local campaigns of, of YouTubers streaming in some area and our logistic network, network getting overloaded there. Uh, yeah, so that, that has been very valuable. 
Um, so now we know what, driving, uh, what is driving customer satisfaction, what metrics we might want to monitor and to detect anomalies on. So let's move on to the steps to actually build this anomaly detection process uh, and to make it work uh, yeah, for a business. So we'll first look in how to set it up. Then I'll discuss some crucial things to actually tune it and make it perfect. Uh, and we end up with maybe the most important step, right? Leveraging it and seeing how you can actually leverage the anomalies you find and the insights you've, uh, you've found. So let, let's start with the st setup phase. Um, I think we all really believe in AI's capabilities nowadays, right? And, and especially the people I'm looking at, I guess we all know that AI can do great things, but still, we learned the hard way that throwing your data set at some outlier detection tool with a lot of AI and getting a lot of anomalies back, that really didn't help us. We got a lot of irrelevant notifications of stuff that could be wrong. We had no clue what to do with it. So really start with defining your clear use case with good metrics and then start your anomaly detection. So that, that's really uh, yeah, something we, we learned the hard way. Uh, secondly, of course, you need to ingest your event stream data. Uh, like I mentioned, we are using the web and app tracking uh, platforms uh, and we uh, use Kinesis as an as a event streaming platform uh, and we use Startree Data Manager to get it into Apache Pinot. So I'm mostly worried with the Kinesis bit because we have Startree uh, SaaS. So uh, yeah, the data manager just abstracts away a lot of the complexity for ingesting that event stream and scaling Pinot. Uh, so that's really cool. And then we have, of course, our anomaly detection model. And this really differs per use case, what model you want to apply. Uh, we use a combination of exponential smoothing with a regression model. And we do that because, yeah, you can imagine that food delivery is really, uh, all the data is really, uh, has a lot of seasonality. People are hungry at particular times of the day, even particular times of the year, you tend to order more. Uh, and there's a clear trend. So we often see that due to COVID, for example, there's a huge trend in, in more orders, um, as well as a lot of event effects. So when there's rain, we'll see a lot more orders. And when there's Christmas, we don't see any orders because the restaurants are closing. And on Valentine's Day, we'll have a way higher average order value because people like to order with two people. Or yeah, people are very sad and order a lot for themselves. Uh, we don't know, actually. I'm sorry about that. So um, secondly, now we've set up our basic anomaly detection process. Uh, we really need to make some good choices and, and tune this, this whole process. And the, the, the most important one, I guess, is the granularity, right? So you can monitor your data on a very high level of detail with a high level of granularity, but you have to take into account that can lead to a lot of anomalies. And also looking at the time period you want to aggregate your data on, so the number of transactions, for example. Um, yeah, you, of course, you can set it to, to, to minutes, uh, and especially with Pinot. Uh, to a minute, but yeah, your data is fluctuating a lot, most likely, if you aggregate on, on, on minute level. So for us, the trade-off was really clear, and uh, we went for uh, a 15-minute time interval, uh, and we monitor our metrics per country, most likely. But maybe in the States, you'll do it per state. Um, and the same goes here. We could monitor it per city, per restaurant, but whenever there's a snowstorm, there are a lot of cities impacted. So you'll have a huge load of anomalies, right? So this granularity is a, is a clear trade-off you have to, to think about. Um, of course, secondly, you want to have feedback on how your model is performing and if it's catching the right anomalies. So having that direct feedback in just a graph where you can turn some knobs and can see, okay, this leads to way more anomalies uh, or this is a good amount of anomalies generated by the, uh, the model. Uh, that's actually very helpful. And also having uh, this upper and lower bound where you can see, okay, how are my acceptance criteria behaving? That's really cool, especially when you want to onboard more people on your uh, anomaly detection platform. And thirdly, you need to yeah, dive into some of your anomalies and find, hey, why is this happening, right? You need to know the root cause of anomaly. And um, for us, it's basically, there are two types of anomalies. It's either something that broke and we need to fix it, either in the data or on a platform or it's a great insight of customer behavior changing. So the, the, these are the two flavors mainly. Um, cool, so that's how you can tune your process and, and make it a success. But then if you have a success, yeah, how to leverage that to the most. And uh, the first one is to really 
stay relevant for the people you send your notifications to. Uh, and we work with subscription groups, so maybe someone is only interested in, in one country, it will only receive notifications from that country, or maybe only in a particular set of metrics. Uh, yeah, so that's all uh, in these uh, subscription groups available to, to do that. Uh, and yeah, the, the most, the, your biggest enemy is alert fatigue, right? And that means that people get sick of your notifications and will not look at them anymore. And I think this is a really, this is really a problem that, that you have to fight. So you have to stay as relevant as possible. Uh, secondly, uh, I think it's really important to, yeah, review your anomalies and set a particular status. Like this is a valid anomaly or this is not a valid anomaly. For two reasons. One, like we already saw, our data teams are increasing by size. And if you have 100 people, maybe 20 people are going to look into it. So. Uh, prevent that duplicate work and make sure you have a, have a tool that, that manages your anomalies and you can set that status for them. And secondly, you want to track the performance of your model, of course. And, and if it's generating too much false alerts, then uh, yeah, you might want to look into it. And lastly, and this is also something I will share in a bit, is yeah, have, that, have, a, have, a, have a platform that can enable you to perform the root cause analysis. Uh, sometimes the clue is in the data, sometimes the clue is by external events. Uh, yeah, and we'll cover both on, on how to deal with that. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, enough of the talking and the slides. So let's, let's actually go into the demo. Let's see. So I'm here in a, in a third eye demo environment with demo data, as you can imagine. And I zoomed in a bit, so normally the layout is, is a tiny bit different, but uh, I want you guys to, to, to be able to see it. So let's go to the welcome flow of, of, of Star Tree Third Eye. And uh, I need to log in, and I want to ask you, Madumita, to do... Oh, I can also log in. Yeah, I can also log in, that's true. You can always send me an email on leon.graveland at just takeaway.com. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If I remember... Oh. Awesome, okay. Um, yeah, so like I said, let's go to the welcome flow. We are in the same demo environment. And uh, we already configured our data, it's in Pinot. Uh, I want to skip that step. Uh, but we want to create an alert. And like I mentioned, an alert is, is an anomaly detection model that you run on a particular data set uh, and you send notifications for. So that's what we call an alert. And this is just an easy welcome flow. And as you can see, there are some uh, very simple algorithms available. And in the welcome flow, there's only one advanced one, but there are way more advanced uh, algorithms available. And you can also bring your own if you want. Uh, and we are going to build two alerts today. I will present you a, a simple one with the percentage rule. And later on, we'll do the exponential smoothing one as well uh, with the multidimensional alert. And we'll come to that later. So cool, let's create a basic alert. And I picked a very straightforward e-commerce data set that covers some orders. Uh, and I will just count the number of orders. And I'm going to compare the number of orders with one week before, and if the percentage change is too high or too low, I will consider it as an anomaly. So the, the, the baseline offset for me is one week, because we have clearly seasonality on a weekly basis. So yeah, we consider one week for now, and let's say if the number of orders went up or down by more than 10%, I consider this as an anomaly. So this is a very straightforward, uh, approach, and we monitor our data on, on, on a daily level for now. In reality, with the app and web tracking data, we did it on 15 minute level, right? So that's a bit different. So we end up with this graph, and let me elaborate on the graph first. So of course we have the, the actuals, uh, the, 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 the total number of orders for that day. We have a particular prediction, and the prediction is not complicated, it's just the value of last week. We'll come to the complicated stuff later. And we have a particular upper and lower bound we can tune, and it shows the anomalies. And this doesn't look good to me. This is too much work and too much anomalies, right? So I feel that we should tweak a bit. Um, so let's go for 30%. And this is all dependent on your use case and your business. And uh, yeah, let's have a look at this. Yeah, this, this might be something I can live with, especially with this clear outlier over there. So let's create this alert and have a look at that particular anomaly. We'll just go to an overview page. I'll click next. Uh, I'll give it uh, some fancy name. And of course, you can pick whenever you want to run your anomaly detection. 
Uh, you can do it daily or per minute, whatever you like. Or you can trigger it through an API call when your data is available. That's, that's something we, we often use. And you can, of course, configure notifications. Uh, the subscription group I, I mentioned earlier, you can pick what group you want to send this particular uh, alert anomalies to. And um, yeah, there's also integrations with Slack and other things, so we use Slack. Um, so let's create it. And we now created our first alert, which is fetching anomalies for us. It just needs a second to uh, actually do the anomaly detection. So here we are. It ran the anomaly detection now. And we uh, really want to know why we have the sudden drop in orders that day. Cool. So it's February the 19th. And uh, it's a drop of 36%, which is a lot. And um, yeah, let's see. I don't, I don't see any investigations of any, for any colleagues. So uh, I'll be the first one to create an investigation for this. And like I mentioned, we have two tools to fix that, or the two tools I mostly use is the heat map and the events. So the heat map is this colorful thing here that basically shows your dimensions. And the color represents the change in contribution, or the contribution in change of that uh, metric, I'm sorry. So if we look, for example, at item category, we see that the groceries dropped with 50%, and the produce only dropped with uh, 20%. So that's interesting, right? So, uh, and, and to even make it more clear, we can add it to the chart, which I'm doing now, and I'll show it. Uh, so let's add the, the, the grocery one and also add the produce one. Uh, and then we look at the chart, and it's almost also pretty obvious from the chart that the uh, groceries went down way more than the produce item categories. So this is already a bit of a clue, but I feel we're not there yet, right? It doesn't tell the whole story why we have this 36% decline. It's just a tiny bit of the story, and it, it generates the right why questions. So maybe there's more to it. Let's see at the event tab what we have there. And this is the place where you can ingest external events that might have impact on your business metrics. So for now, holidays are available, but you can think of product releases, severe weather. Uh, you can all ingest it there, uh, and you can also add a custom event. Maybe there's this really one-off huge marketing campaign. Well, you can add it here, right? So uh, you can also just manually add it. Uh, but yeah, the holidays are in this demo environment available. And I see a lot of carnival during the, or around the 19th of February. So let's select some carnival events uh, and plot it on the graph. Oh, I'm not, shouldn't click there. It's already plotted on the graph. And this is already, I think, a better story. So we know this weekend it's, it has been carnival and it's a carnival like in country. And uh, yeah, during, during carnival, people like more gross or less groceries and more produced products, something like that. So I'm happy with this conclusion. Let's save our investigations and say during carnival, people don't like groceries, but do like produce. Okay, so we save our investigation and we can now go back to anomaly. And of course, uh, the anomaly, uh, the investigation is, is visible on anomaly. And I forgot to actually set a status, right? So we can just say, yes, this is a valid anomaly. So people know my conclusion. So this covered the, the normal, uh, a very basic uh, workflow of how to create this alert and how to do an investigation and, and check your anomalies. So now we're interested in, in a more advanced algorithm stuff, right, I guess. So let's go again to the welcome flow and create our second alert, actually, not the first. And we want to create uh, an alert with exponential smoothing and we'll do a multidimensional alert because we just learned that it looks like maybe sometimes groceries and produce products, they tend to have a different pattern and different behavior. So it might make sense for us to create, to, to detect these anomalies on these dimensions, right, separately. And uh, we really use that a lot for countries. We have a lot of different customer behavior over our countries. So for all the metrics we monitor, we do it per country and we create a multidimensional alert. Uh, so how does that work? Um, we use the same data set again. And we just count the number of records. We select the, the dimension here, and it was item category. And actually, Third Eye tries to help you in which dimension values you need to use while you're detecting anomalies. So it says, okay, maybe only do the 
the, the ones that contribute more than 5% to the total metric. So we'll, we'll, it produces that list, but I still think it's a bit too much uh, because yeah, I don't like that many notifications, right? I only want the relevant ones, so maybe up it to 10, and we end up with this beautiful list of three item categories. And I'm happy with this, so let's uh, try to detect anomalies on these three uh, dimension values separately. So we'll create this alert, and we now need to tune it. Um, we want to tune it, we have a particular sensitivity we can tune that's really tied to the exponential smoothing algorithm we have. Uh, of course, we need to decide on what granularity and the seasonality period and the lookback period. Lookback period meaning how many data do I want to use for one particular data point to predict the next one, right? So it's looking for today to the last 28 days. Um, so let's see how that plays out. Of course, we have three time series and we have to evaluate these three time series. And yeah, I'm not too happy with this one. It's, it's too minor change. Prediction maybe is a bit off, I don't know. So we need to tune sensitivity and we want less alumni, so I'll set it to medium and reload the preview. And I'm very happy because this one is, is definitely one I needed to catch uh, because that one seemed off. The rest of the pattern was, was fine to me actually. So let's create it with medium sensitivity. Press again next. And now we actually created, yeah, it's one alert, but we are monitoring three time series on three different dimension values. Um, and we can attach different subscription groups to these dimension values. Uh, yeah, so basically that concludes the demonstration. So I think uh, what I tried to show was what metrics you can monitor from a customer lens and, um, I'm sorry, what impacts customer satisfaction and especially how you can uh, yeah, build an uh, anomaly detection process on top of it with, uh, with Third Eye. And before we go to the Q&A, uh, I want to give it word to, uh, to Madhu again for the last bit. Thank you, Leon. That was a pretty good demo. I was completely lost watching it. Thanks for sharing your journey with us. Um, very uh, promising to see your results. So I have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, so if you are interested in knowing more about Third Eye, uh, what we provide is in beta state, and what we already provide in beta state is uh, in the left hand side, where dimension level monitoring that Leon was showing earlier that that's available 15 minutes alerting is possible in real time and anomaly filters, which are advanced anomaly filters and everything you get point and click experience. We also support data mutability support. One thing I wanted to call out, even though you're monitoring real time metrics, most of, most of the time the business metrics needs a blend of real time and offline. And with Pino, these things are a lot more easier. And for that reason, we also provide mutability support. What's coming up next? Well, Third Eye Genie, that is something we are working on. Uh, uh, it will be, uh, we will be doing a blog about it in a couple of days and you will read about it more um, in uh, what we are going to tell as part of that is what to monitor instead of boiling the entire ocean. And then uh, we have a couple of other things like data drift detection and root cause analysis 2.0. The version you saw earlier, uh, we are making it more guided so that uh, you're not lost in how to find your root cause. So uh, that's about Stratry Third Eye, and there are a couple of interesting th uh, Stratry product launches are also happening if you are not aware of this, I just wanted to quickly share with you all, and you can always stop by after this session at our booth to learn more. We are already um, in cloud, and uh, bring your own cloud or dedicated um, SaaS. We provide both the experience. Uh, we provide in all the uh, cloud, like Azure, AWS, and GCP. Uh, so now we are in Azure. Uh, in Pino, um, we have recent uh, multi-stage query engine support uh, that is very promising. Pino control panel, it's now in preview. Um, you can do a lot more with point and click experience um, and manage your Pino clusters without uh, spending too much time. Data Manager 2.0, you can bring uh, your data from multiple sources from anywhere with point and click experience. You can also model your data in um, in the experience and ingest the data to Pinot. 
uh, and then of course we went over third eye. So with that, uh, we conclude our presentation. Thanks for listening to us. If you have any questions, then the Q&A is, uh, yeah, the floor is open for Q&A. Okay, I see one question up there. Hi, I just wanted to ask, how does the annotation of this is a correct anomaly, this is not an anomaly, kind of get factored into the algorithm for future runs? Does it like modify the thresholds um, or is this like an under the hood kind of optimization? Um, just curious about that. So if I have to repeat your question, um, you are asking how does the anomalies uh, detected and how it, how the data is optimized. Sorry, I no. So um, once an anomaly is detected, there is an annotation that someone can say that this was a correct anomaly or this is not an anomaly. How does that user feedback kind of get um, utilized in the platform? Just more curious about that. Yeah. So you are asking how the user feedback is uh, sent back to the model when the model is running again and uh, how it is considered. That's correct. So if you are uh, asking more in the implementation side, I have uh, Subhadeep here. Do you want to answer that question? Uh, so yeah, what we do is uh, we save, I mean, first of all, we are saving that annotation on the anomaly, right? So we have interfaces in through which your model, if it wants, can go ahead and look at that data and, uh, and then consume that data. So we have infrastructure for that. That's going to be released later. But currently, for example, if we have something like a basic threshold model, that's not going to use that, all of that information at all. But what we've created is, is a way to absorb all of this feedback into the system. And you can actually, like, obviously these, uh, every dog food out on APIs and all of this data is very uh, easy for you to consume. And once you consume that, you can tune your model and then add it back. So that, that's the feedback mechanism. So yes, you can do it externally, but we do it internally as well in some cases. Gotcha, thank you. So if you're uh, looking for like what it does, uh, it's background, it is storing the data again, and then that's being fed to the model training. Just uh, one question more on the, I guess on the impact of this work, like what was the, the results from this work, like, you know, did you take, did you detect anomalies which you wouldn't have otherwise have detected? I mean, I imagine there's business people looking at these KPIs anyways, no? So I, I'm just wondering what the, like, the ROI of that whole uh, project was. What's the ROI of uh, building uh, or enabling a solution like this? Is that what your question is? Uh, more in the specific case of just uh, it takeaways. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think the tricky bit with anomaly detection is that you have to wait for your perfect anomaly, right? And, and that, that is just taking some while, but we had some successes and uh, what, how we work is we look for owners of these metrics and of these specific, specific customer journeys and we onboard them. And with some of them, we didn't have any anomaly yet. And with some of them, they were really happy that we were there. So that's a bit of how it works. But in the end, uh, adoption with these things is a bit hard because of course you can say you had an anomaly a year ago, but they don't care. So um, yeah, it, it takes some time to actually uh, leverage this, but uh, yeah, then they really feel that uh, yeah, you enable them to make data-driven decisions. And that's yeah, what we as data department really like to do. Thanks. One other thing I would like to add in addition to what Leon said uh, is data democratization is a very uh, happening thing these days. Like this handful of team, you are the platform owners, you don't have bandwidth to respond to every stakeholders and respond to them. So you want to enable a self-serve experience. And how it works in terms of ROI, if you look at like in uh, in terms of the cost savings that you do, like effort that you would spend in these data ops, Instead, you could have built something interesting and then make it more productive for uh, yourself and for your users. That's what it is taking up. And if you do really calculation, we have seen like in uh, at least 50x improvement in terms of efforts uh, once it is, of course, the adoption kicks in. So there's a little bit of adoption effort needed, and that's typical for any of the uh, technical data product, uh, this literacy gap you need to close. And that's why we provide a lot of documentation and how-to video. And there's a little bit of uphill battle you have to face and uh, educate your users, but once they are up to speed, it's more self-served, 
and that's the ROI you should also look at in addition. And uh, besides, I think we also look at more of value delivery. So at that time, cost doesn't come into picture. Like we have seen at LinkedIn, sounds a campaign uh, where we were able to detect anomalies, campaign overflow situation, overspend, and we have saved in million dollars. So sometimes what metrics you are monitoring and how much it is driving your bottom line revenue, that could also change the game and the ROI would be very clear in that case. See one more question. So I have a question uh, regarding like uh, the inference that you were making, right? So you were talking about produce and uh, grocery being related, right? So is is that something that you just see and you uh, you know draw the conclusion, or do you go to like a sa statistical you know kind of analyze whether there is a correlation or not and have some confidence interval and stuff that you yeah. analyze? So and maybe then I'll, come to a conclusion. I'll attempt to answer this and so if you can chime in further, what his yeah, I, I think she is asking for the heat map, how we are trying to derive the heat map contribution. Yeah, or, or the choice or to what dimension you're monitoring your, your metrics, right? Whether it's for this or on these item categories, which item categories you picked or why you are defining yeah, them? Yeah, like uh, you, were, you were just picking produce and grocery, right? So you yeah. saw that there was like a dip in grocery yeah. and then you picked produce and grocery. So do you like involve some statistics there, like correlation Yeah, so how the heat like map is based, uh, are you asking how the heat map is generated? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. the question. So I'll, I'll try to answer and then maybe Subhadeep, you can also chime in. Uh, so uh, we actually look into the data in more, more granularity, each dimensions, each nodes in the data and how it is contributing overall uh, with the change. And one thing um, in the, uh, when you were looking at the demo, default it was one week over week. And sometimes you can go back in period, whichever, how many days possible. And then uh, you look at the uh, deviations that has happened. And you look across all the nodes and then look which is high impacting and based on some weighted score and based on that you derive the color code, like where it is deep blue versus uh, light blue or deep red versus light red and that's the shift in the uh, deviation or shift in the metrics that has happened at that uh, dimension level and all these are happening through an algorithm and if you are interested in knowing like can it be correlated next time if you are identifying an anomaly um, so I think the correlated metrics is interesting. We are allowing to do some custom metrics uh, anomaly detection, but for that little bit of customization is needed. You have to build custom templates, but it is very much doable uh, through like simple JSON code writing, and then you can pass some configurations to that. Um, did I answer your question? And uh, I think I'll also let Subhadeep talk about a little bit of on the technical. So uh, I think you covered pretty much the heat map part. One thing I would like to add that we didn't show in the demo is that we also have a top contributors where we actually, uh, instead of you going through, so first of all, the job of the heat map is to make it very visible, like, you know, where things are changing. And that's what the whole point of heat map is, right? We drill down against um, different combinations of dimensions and try to point out, hey, you know, here I see a lot of turbulence versus in other cases which are much more gray. That's basically what it's trying to do. But we also have the top contributors where we actually try to come up with a curated list of things. I think that was not shown, but that actually goes ahead and tries to directly answer your question that, okay, what am I trying, trying to look at? So um, that is an attempt and that, that will get better over time. It does a pretty good job right now in simple cases. But if you have, let's say, hundreds of dimensions uh, and a lot of turbulence in all of these things, which is, which is typical of if you have like real-time data sets, so yes, uh, that, uh, that gives you a list, but I think the heat map actually is a much more visual tool of you know, seeing exactly where your uh, you know, data is changing a lot. So if that helps. Yeah, uh, thanks. Okay. So if you have more questions, you can always stop by later and uh, talk to us.